We've really covered quite the gamut in over the days, uh, over, over the days uh, proceedings. Um, I'd like to start off with a question about our setting. Right now, here in Southeast Asia, there seems to be a real series of opportunities, a real coming out of China's shadow, for example, um, something of a moment. At the same time, we're also coming up against some global headwinds that spell uncertainty for Southeast Asia, be it, uh, be it rising interest rates in the U.S., a trade war between the U.S. and China. Um, give, me a little bit of, give me a little bit of a sense. You personally have placed a big bet on Singapore, uh, making this your home several years ago, and also with B Capital, 360 million, uh, your first fund, 360 million spread in various parts of the world, but a big part of it here in Southeast Asia. Why Southeast Asia? Why now? Absolutely. And when I think of Southeast Asia in the context of the broader global macro, uh, I, I tend to you know, disregard it slightly and think about the actual dynamics of Southeast Asia, which are incredibly exciting. So, you know, first of all, it's a massive market. We have, uh, I think if you include both Southeast Asia and South Asia, including India, over 1 billion people in the middle class in the coming years. Uh, you also have a very young uh, energetic population with over 40% in Southeast Asia being uh, under the, 70% being under the age of uh, 40. Uh, and that's just uh, the, the tip of the iceberg, the demographics, because I think what really matters, it's a truly global, mobile-first environment. And I think we talk about mobility and the ubiqu ubiquity of it across the world. But if, when you think of Southeast Asia, their usage on mobile devices per day, uh, in some cases, is over one hour uh, above than that of the U.S. and multiples uh, in, in broadly uh, developed markets. And you have the largest growth, single growth of uh, mobile internet connections happening in this area. And I think being mobile first uh, uh, in, in, in a true uh, environment is one of the key differentiating facts of, of, of Southeast Asia. But I think beyond that, you have a venture capital uh, and, and opportunity set uh, that is incredibly unique in terms of where we are today versus where we should be. So from a percentage of GDP, I think if you look at both India and Southeast Asia, uh, you're sub 20.2% versus in the US around 0.4, China 0.3. So there is a big discrepancy as well into uh, the amount of capital going into venture capital. Uh, here today. Um, would like to know um, geographically right now where where are your investments spread generally and how do you expect that will change over the next five to ten years? Maybe Kabir? Yeah, you know, so we, we have uh, 20 companies in the portfolio and uh, if you step back, it's set up as a global fund. I think the advantage of that is we can dial up dial down geographies. And we think that's really important is you know, not to have specific targets of a particular area or not, because if some markets get you know, more frothy than others, you can kind of be more cautious. In some cases, if others are kind of uh, you know, showing interesting opportunities, you can kind of double down. Um, I think if you look at it, we have over half of our investments right now outside the US. And so we think, you know, we're sitting here in Singapore, we think the markets of Southeast Asia and India are very interesting ones. I think it's also very interesting because of the stage that we're playing in. Um, we think this, the Series B, Series C stage is, is just a really interesting spot. Um, it suits us well because a lot of us come from you know, business building backgrounds, backgrounds of investing, where we do want to be able to see data to make better decisions. And so that's part of being at Series B, Series C that's helpful for us. Uh, but also then how do we connect some of those interesting companies to larger corporates? So when you put that all together, we think of you know, big opportunities um, that are there, especially in the stage. Uh, we think South Asia and India is really important markets. Um, and you know, we'll look at portfolios purely from a global lens, uh, even when we evaluate them. You mentioned that connection to corporates. Uh, something, one of your selling points to startups uh, at B Capital is Boston Consulting Group, that BCG. 
um, that's something you sort of tend to wear on your sleeve a bit. When I think of startups, I think of com companies that, well, we're going to kind of blaze our own trail. Um, we're going to do it our own way. How do you kind of reconcile the idea of, hey, we're ripping up the playbook, right? On one hand. On the other hand, why do I need advice from consult a consultant? Um, I'm doing it for the first time. Why do I want to hear from someone who's kind of using a tried and true formula, for lack of a better word? You know, I think that if we step back and we think about BCG or our partnership, I think there are uh, three really tangible areas in particular where, where we kind of, it, it helps us. I think one is since we're attacking or thinking about large traditional industries, um, I think an understanding of what those industries are, you know, what's happening in the industry is very important. And, you know, an institution like BCG has got, you know, just immense uh, understanding and knowledge of that, right? So if you look at the industries we focused on, transportation, 7% of world GDP. Right. Uh, you look at healthcare, 9% of world GDP. Uh, you look at financial services, 15% of, of world GDP. These are large sectors which you want to be able to understand what players in the sector are doing, and that you know a, a partnership like this is very helpful for us. I think second is, because we're going global, I think we want to be able to understand trends very deeply and very kind of quickly, and so that helps us in that context. And third is, you know, I think the days of you know, uh, young startups in a garage trying to disrupt the world was, it was interesting, but I think it wouldn't be fantastic that if they could get the support to connect to some of the large corporates. And so I think that being that interesting translation engine, something we do and some of our partners help us do that much better. And I think, you know, just to add a few, a, a few things, meaning it's, you know, the aura of entrepreneurship is, as, as Kabir was describing, young kids in a garage, dorm room, incubation space, taking on the largest businesses in the world and uh, ultimately, one way or another, turning them into a zero. Uh, but I think we're past that today. And there's a, I think there is a, 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 a positive synergistic relationship in my view, especially as you start moving away from uh, slightly easier markets to tackle like media and, and commerce, despite the, its complexity, to incredibly regulated, incredibly large traditional industries where young kids in a garage, dorm room, incubation space should actually you know, take a step back and say, what can I leverage? How can I bring my agile development, my technology, my new way of thinking to the assets, distribution network, regulatory know-hows of the largest businesses in the world? And somehow develop a relationship where uh, the agility of a startup can be tied with the comprehensiveness, market knowledge, and establishment of the big businesses in the world. And frankly, how are you going to get technology to the hand of consumers quicker? Is not by disruption, it's by transformation. And in transformation, it, I think at the heart of it is partnership first. Don't go destroy everyone else and try to take everyone on. Try to do that in part, but look at those partners that genuinely can align. And in some ways, right, if you think about the evolution of the, of, of the web and platforms, uh, Facebook in the early days became a platform and opened its APIs to a bunch of businesses. Why shouldn't the largest businesses of the world be viewed to startups as an asset base? And why shouldn't some of the elements of those businesses that they are okay uh, growing in collaboration be opened up and develop an API for small businesses to accelerate together. I think one of, the, one of your portfolio companies that's intriguing to me and certainly intriguing to regulators in San Francisco is, is, uh, is Bird. Right. This is this is a start. This is a scooter startup. This is really kind of brings together a lot of the cross currents that we've been talking about today. The future of cities, the future of transportation, and at the same time, it seems to me you guys have a you know what you're talking about partnerships, talking about you know taking on established industries like transportation. It's very complicated. It's very regulated. So maybe drill down for me and talk about how you bring your unique set of. Um, advice, your distinctives to advising Bird in what is a very complicated 
um, you know, set of, set of markets around the world? Yeah, so you know, if you, if you look at Bird, I think it's uh, one, you know, part of, of course, what excited us was uh, just the, you know, immense scale and transformation potential. We, we saw literally month on month, they were kind of doubling uh, number of rides. So we think, you know, immense potential. I think, you know, where partnerships help is, you know, how do you think about it? You go from city by city. And how, how do you think about being partners and think about the win-win situations there, right? So what was fascinating in some of the cities like Santa Monica, and, uh, you, you almost had, and you looked at rides by individuals, and 53% of those were in the zero to three mile uh, radius. Right? And so what's interesting is it's clearly that happening, uh, and one of the best form of commute, of course, walking is great. Um, if not, you know, is cars really the best form, vehicles really the best form? Uh, I think here it's a win-win where you know, it's, it's carbon-free, you kind of got an environmental benefit. Um, you've got a benefit where consumers can often get there much quicker. I think here in, in markets like in Asia, we see things like traffic congestion are, are kind of big issues. And so you can see those as win-win situations. Um, we're starting to see that adoption happen where cities are thinking about things in a much more you know, one-year, three-year, five-year time frame, right? So the fact that a, a company like Bird is now in 40 cities uh, is showing some of that adaptation uh, adoption by consumers, but also you're seeing uh, city authorities kind of think about things very holistically. So we think that's a great idea of, you know, win-win situation, carbon-free, better way for commuters to, to kind of move, um, reduces congestion time, and how do you find the right win-win situation? That's, you know, part of what we were excited about in the uh, investment there. As we think about transportation, you can't really have a conversation about how we're going to get around in the future without talking about autonomous, autonomous vehicles, self, self-driving cars. A lot, of, a lot of attention, a lot of money is going into this space. Um, and I would argue, you know, based on what we've seen with some pivots among early LiDAR companies, um, some of the, uh, there's a lot of hype. So, I, you know, as you look at AV opportunities, can you give me a sense of, you know, where there's froth and how you kind of avoid some of the hype cycle around it? Absolutely. I mean, it's an incredibly exciting space. And I think meaning being in the conference that's titled Sooner Than You Think, I think I would have to say that, you know, autonomy as an element of mobility in smart cities will be something that will happen sooner than we think. And... You know, yes, you're correct. There's tremendous amounts of investments in the space, uh, both from a venture capital perspective, from a corporate perspective, the largest OEMs in the world, the suppliers to OEMs are investing heavily in it. But I think when you, you think about, you know, what will drive adoption, what are the key sort of tenants that will bring this uh, industry forward, I think it goes down to several points. First is around human psychology, right? Would you get on an autonomous vehicle? I think the answer for me is, cool, I'm there in two seconds. Uh, my mom would say, you know, in another lifetime. Um, just, just for the, so I think there's an element around human psychology that is important, uh, you know, to think through. But I think beyond that is the next one, which is back to, you know, artificial intelligence, decision making. How do you, you know, drive agility in how you decide, enable computing uh, to decide in a way that does similar to a human, but perfects it. And I think part of that is multi-senses. You're talking about LiDAR, but how do you fuse sensors? How do you think about vision? And that's a very challenging computational challenge for you to stream HE video instantaneously amongst multiple cameras around the, a car and be able to compute immediately and then sense it with your radar, with your LiDAR, and other potential fusions to then make an instantaneous decision. Uh, so I think the technology has to provide you know, leaps and bounds. We've invested in a company that is you know, heavily called AI Motive, heavily uh, developing what you'd say is a, a vision-first uh, sensor fusion approach to autonomy. Uh, and I think beyond that then comes the, you know, the typical challenges, one of them being one that you know, even companies in the Facebook category of media you know, depend on, which is network effects. Uh, if you have one autonomous car out there, it's a lot more challenging that you have a fully autonomous uh, ecosystem where one car can communicate with another, where, as an example, if a person is walking, 
that car could understand that it's an individual versus a dog versus something else. How do you fuse all that together? And I think uh, that network effects would be one of the elements that uh, is required together with regulation uh, and infrastructure building to enable this all to take place. But I think it's a very exciting category that we, we know will happen. You've, uh, one, of the, one of the more intriguing uh, uh, portfolio companies, as I was reviewing your, the list, um, is a company called Fishbrain. I want to hear a little bit more about what caught your eye about that company and what it tells us about or what it potentially tells us about the future of social networking. So you know, be before Eduardo talks about the future <laughs> social networking, you know, <laughs> what I found fascinating when we were looking at that, and a uh, you know, long time back, I used to play golf. It, it seemed to have stopped over the last five years. No time left? No that... time left. Uh, but what was shocking is uh, the whole sport fishing industry um, is actually larger than golf as a category. So it's a really large market size, uh, which, which obviously first caught eye. Um, and it's an interesting pattern that you see but even like on, on Fishbrain, they're, they're kind of uh, uh, 5 million users that are, that are kind of on the platform, uh, really thinking about things of you know, sharing things about data, weather. Uh, of course, there's a bit of uh, you know, sharing what kind of how the size of the catch, et cetera. And so there's, there's a lot of, uh, I'd say, a, a discrete community that's keen to kind of talk, discover, share. Um, and that in a large market, and then you, you add on a terrific founder and team is, is what we found very exciting. Yeah, and I think meaning social networking is is a a broadly defined term, but I think you know this this evolution of uh, nichification of of how we engage interact, I think is 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 is, is just going back to the broader thesis, which is you know, the, even to the early days of Facebook, it's about mimicking what happens in the real world. It's about uh, enabling you inter to interact with, with individuals in an authentic way uh, that enables it to happen efficiently. And what, what happens even for today, I believe, and in the future for horizontal networks is a lot of the use cases aren't per se broad. <laughs> Uh, they are highly niche, right? If you think of the messaging layer of, of networks today, a lot of that is one-to-one -one or group-based. Uh, in large networks, you see the you know, evolution of uh, beyond just chatting, group-based behaviors, uh, social viewing of videos, uh, social selling that developed itself into niche formats like Marketplace in the example of, of Facebook, something that evolved you know, very naturally. And I think when you think of niche networks like a fish brain, what you have to think about is, is first, is it, a, is it a category where there is enough people interested in it? And fishing, meaning I was a, a, a uh, hobbyist when I was young, and, and maybe part of the reason it caught my eye is, let me go back to my uh, childhood uh, and uh, do a little bit of fishing. But it is one of the largest uh, f uh, hobbies in the world. Uh, second, what is the level of engagement that people have in it? Is it, okay, a lot of people do it, but do they have deep passion for it? Is it something that they will spend a lot of time around? I think, I think the you know, third category is a, a more practical one. Is it monetizable? Is it a large market? Which the, the fishing industry ends up being. And then is there an actual benefit in having a different interface? Uh, in a, a different UI layer experience to make it efficient? And I think the answer is yes uh, in respect to, to, to phishing. And it sounds, uh, meaning at the surface, investing in a, you know, in a phishing-related community, whoa, where did that come from? But uh, it really fits every single one of those criteria in, in, in a very clear way. Uh, I, I like the idea of affinity groups, um, and what, you know, you're asking people who are, you know, who love this, who love fishing, or you know, some other social network. Maybe it's on Formula One. We're about to see a big, you know, F1 here. Um, uh, I see the whole city kind of transforming itself. You name it. We're always asking people to become part of a community, um, and that sounds great, especially at the outset. Um, what kinds of advice do you give to management of a portfolio company like Fishbrain 
when it comes to seeing the unforeseen circumstances, one could argue that, in fact, people at, at Facebook and Twitter and, and other social, social platforms have talked about, you know, we, we just didn't foresee the ways that information could be misused, could filter out and get, you know, get, get misused and used against people. So kind of how do you advise somebody at the early stages, um, you know, sort of at the first floor of building this to avoid those unforeseen circumstances? Do you want to go first, Kabir? I I'll let you take that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's why I have a very smart partner <laughs> to, to push it back to me. <laughs> no, but it's, uh, it, it, it's a great question, and I think an uh, incredibly important one. Um, you know, one thing that I would say, meaning back to, you know, some of the comments that you made to sort of the early days of, you know, Facebook and, you know, what we would have thought of, uh, you know, how the data and the community was going to develop. I mean, humbly, I say there's no way we would have imagined the community to grow as big as it did. And its use case is to become as, 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 as massive and, and, and widespread as, as it has become. Uh, but to be an entrepreneur, you have to have an intrinsic optimism in the use case. And in that case, it was a pretty obvious starting point of college students building something for college students. And I think at the broader calculus around how do you look and evolve a community, is, it's back to the fundamentals in terms of advice to our entrepreneurs. First and foremost, uh, you know, develop intrinsic understanding of the product market fit. It was easy for us in the early days of Facebook because we were building for college students, eventually happened to have a much wider use case uh, and, and helped, you know, develop the system to connect the world. But make sure you understand who you're building it for. Make sure you developed iterative types of tools to describe the, the give and take. If you provide data, if you provide information, this is the benefit that you're getting from it. Uh, and this is its use case uh, going forward. Uh, in, in some ways, it's, it's a calculus uh, that you need to be very sort of uh, uh, purposeful with uh, and deeply continue to be agile, understanding your users and adapting uh, going forward. And I think that ultimately will serve you, will serve you right. Uh, it's stay true to your users, your commercial use case, but clearly uh, provide a UX interface, a, a clear understanding of the calculus on all ends. Before we get, I, I want to pivot away from Facebook. Don't worry, I'm not going to talk <laughs> about that all day long. But I do want to ask, you know, it's been a rough year for them. Um, as you sit halfway around the world with someone who has a very clear vested interest in that company, what's it been like to kind of watch the, the trajectory of events unfolding there? Yeah, of course, it's uh, difficult to see a company that's so close to my heart, you know, going through a, a point of, you know, public scrutiny as they have been going now. But one thing I will say is I have tremendous faith in, in Mark, the team that he has built around him, uh, and, and frankly, in, in the intentions that, you know, Facebook was born out of, uh, you know, from, from day one and, and how they are developing solutions going forward and how they're starting to implement them that, you know, they will, you know, get through this. I think, uh, you know, it suffices to say that, you know, with, with a team that has, you know, at, at its core philosophy, listening to, to users, listening to parties that they engage with, uh, and trying to adapt uh, to the circumstances from day one, uh, that's what we were, an agile firm. Uh, they, they, they will weather through this. Once again, in yesterday's hearings in the U.S., Cheryl, Jack were there. Once again, the question of government regulation came up. Um, should social networks be subject to greater regulation, and is it inevitable? I think, you know, it's, it's, it's not a question of if, it's a question of the type of regulation always. The one thing as an as a outside observer in the case of 
you know, Facebook, and, and today I'm not a direct entrepreneur in the uh, social uh, category. I'm not running my own business today. I'm helping others scale their, their businesses. Uh, you know, what I would say is the, you know, the, the ecosystem needs to be fully and utterly open to working with government, uh, industry and whoever it might be to uh, to uh, to drive if required the best type of and possible type of regulation. But one thing I would always prevent is the type of regulation that might stifle innovation. Right, this idea that very large businesses, you know, might have the capital and resources to you know answer to regulatory frameworks while. Uh, smaller, agile ones might be less able to. So whatever comes out of this, and I think there's, there will be some healthy solution, do one that never stifles innovation and the ability to democratize innovation in, in, in that field and category. Thanks. I and, you know, if you, if you almost take that, you move slightly when you talk about from a B capital perspective and some of the industries we're looking at, uh, you know, the other, other, what is interesting is, a lot of industry that we focused on, if you look at healthcare, financial services, transportation, uh, you know, a lot of those are actually heavily regulated uh, industries, right? And so I think what becomes quite useful next three years, five years, 10 years, is for a lot of technology companies to be thinking about regulation, to be working with partners who kind of understand that. Uh, and, you know, coming back to the earlier point we were talking about, it is a partnership first approach. And, and so how do you work very closely with your partners really transform uh, some of these businesses. So you know, that's the other thing which we constantly think about in, you know, from a B, B capital perspective. Another region that has grabbed your attention um, and certainly that of many venture capitalists is India, obviously. Um, M-Swipe is the payments company that yep. you, uh, is part of your portfolio there. Um, a lot of venture, a lot of startups in India are very dependent on foreign capital. Um, at the same time, there are times where we hear rumblings about, you know, foreign capital being a sort of a bad thing. Um, um, and the sort of the impetus to be a little bit more protectionist of local, of, of, of local industries. Can you talk a little bit about the opportunity and the challenge uh, of India right now? Maybe start with you, Kabir, and why M-Swipe seemed like the right choice at this time? Yeah, so let me talk about the India opportunity and then kind of M-Swipe. I think uh, at some level, in fact, India has been very open um, to kind of venture capital, private equity, right? So when I, in fact, uh, having, having worked in the U.S. for a few years, moved back in 06, I think that's been, since 06 onwards, you've seen in general evolution of private equity venture in general. Um, you've seen lots of interesting investments. I think at some point there has been some question on saying how many exits uh, do you see? I think the Flipkart uh, exit was actually very healthy for the ecosystem. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot more of those going forward. I think entrepreneurs are focused on that. Um, you know, investors are focused on that. LPs are focused on that. So I think that's very positive in that, in that context. I think it's really interesting market because it's now a combination of things coming together. You have almost like 450 million internet users. Again, young population, you know, average age is about 28, 29. Um, you're starting to see interesting help with uh, regulation as well, right? We had this, uh, the, the GST, which was trying to standardize, you know, standardize taxes. And so that's, there's a lot of impetus happening to kind of scale, scale the country. Um, very high quality entrepreneurs. And now you're seeing the next generation of entrepreneurs, like recently I was reading a, a funding of ex-Flipkart uh, executive. And so you're seeing the next generation of serial entrepreneurs come out. And so that's an interesting space. I think we're also seeing a lot of the two types of opportunities, India for India and India for the globe, right? And so even before we go to MSWIPE, we've invested in a company called iCertis, which is actually, you know, we think it's going to be the contract management platform of the world. But the development of that is actually happening in, a, in, in Pune, uh, based out of India. And, but all clients, uh, companies headquartered in Seattle, but it's really powering the innovation of a really large category. Um, I think in India, we took the view in a you know, couple of things. One is even in commerce or e-commerce, uh, how do we back some of the enablers? And so there we've backed things like uh, Bizongo, which is a B2B commerce in the packaging space. M-Swipe was part of that theme and thesis 
which is saying, we're seeing a big move of, of kind of payments, a move to digital, uh, and then how do we almost su support a company which could be almost like the square for, for the region, uh, really transform, uh, uh, transform an old industry. And so I think that's, that was what excited us. Um, if you look at the number of merchants, small merchants in India, there are actually 15 million small merchants. Uh, and Swipe's you know, one of the largest independent acquirers in that space. Uh, a lot more you can do with the merchant there. So really coming down to great entrepreneur, really large market, uh, differentiated product, and that's what we're very excited with Swipe uh, in that particular investment.